Yeah, that's me you're looking at on screen. I'm Johnny Rizzo, and I'm a stand-up comic. I've been one for over 30 years. I work from Maine to Guatemala on cruise ships, nightclubs, Atlantic City, Las Vegas, and TV. You wonder how one becomes a comic, or becomes anything for that matter. Chances are it starts from your past experiences, how you grew up, what you've been through, what you've seen and done. Well, I'm going back to my past, to my old neighborhood, to my old stomping grounds, to the place where I was born. You know, just to figure out how did I get here. Still the same, just a little more crowded now. Seems like everybody's got a car, man. We had one car for one family, and that was it, and everybody had to borrow it. Now everybody, every kid has a car. There's like one family in a house with five cars. There's the North End Boys Club and Girls Club right there. I remember going in the back over there, man, partying with some girls, man, with my friends. Never spent much time in the Boys Club. I think I was in the Boys Club all of like uh, two days total. Yeah, it just wasn't my scene. The street was my scene. Wow, I'm coming up to my old street right now. This is a trip. McKinley Avenue. Where I was born and raised, man. McKinley Avenue. The bar in the corner is different now. That used to be Nine Brothers Bar. Now it's the Oasis. Look at that. It's got gates on it and stuff. You gotta lock up the alcohol. Alcohol did something bad, I guess. Someone wants to take it. One or the other. I think it's the latter. Check out my old street. All right, here we are, the old school neighborhood, man. This is where I came from. It's so funny when you come back to your old neighborhood, because it's like everything's the same, but everything seems smaller. The street seems smaller, the houses, everything seems so tight together, you know? Right here, this is my house where I grew up in. My uncle in the second floor, all my cousins, and my grandmother owned this house, and she also owned this house right here. This was primarily an Italian Jewish neighborhood when I grew up. And it was like, uh, it was like everybody, hey, what's happening, baby? It was, uh, it was like, you know, all the neighbors knew each other by name, you know, we had uh, a lot of relationships with our, with, our, with our neighbors. And the mailboxes are still exactly where they were. I don't, I mean, I don't, not this specific mailbox, but right here was a, bench too. My father would sit there, my mother. Yeah, I used to slide down this railing when I was a kid. I said, nah, nah, I don't think I'm gonna. My stunt days are over. But you know what? This is where my father would sit every day. You see, my father had open heart surgery in 1969. The year the Mets won the World Series. And he was a Met fan. And the reason why he was a Met fan, my Uncle John and my Uncle Salvatore upstairs were Yankee fans. So my father liked to rub it in, you know what I mean? He went for the Mets. If they went for the Giants, he went for the Jets. It was just that way. It was just like a little, like, you know, antagonism between brothers. And then he had open heart surgery again the second time the Mets won the World Series. And it, I, I really truly believe that when I used to go to the Veterans Hospital, because he was a World War II veteran, and I used to tell him about the Mets winning the World Series, I think that's what really pulled him through. Because that's all he wanted to know. How are the Mets doing? How are the Mets doing? And it was just like God planned these World Series around my father's surgeries. I really believe it was some kind of spiritual intervention. And my father would sit here every day. He used to do it like this with his hands. I guess, you know, to get his blood moving, you know, he'd do, do this all the time. Then he would look at his hands. He used to look at his hands. And I would come out of the house or come back to the house and he, he would grill me. He goes, where were you? What the hell were you doing? Where are you going now? You going to hang out with the, the gang of yours? What, are you getting in trouble? What'd you steal today? What are you up to? Do me a favor, here's 50 cents. Go up to Sam's Deli on the corner and get me a bag of pistachio nuts. Give me the red ones, don't give me the white ones, give me the red ones. 
Sam had a, a Jewish deli with box and bagels, cream cheese, all that stuff. And he had these big jars, mason jars, full of pistachio nuts. And my father's fingers would be all red from opening up the uh, pistachio nuts. He used to go up to that bar in the corner. It used to be called Nine Brothers. And he used to sit there in the window and play pinochle with the guys. I don't think anybody plays pinochle anymore. As a matter of fact, today's world, we watch people playing poker on television. Is that nuts? We don't even have poker games with, with the neighborhood and the family. We watch other people play poker. I just don't get that, man. I really don't. So my father, you know, like I said, he was in the army. And he was in the Philippine conflict fighting against the Japanese army. And I remember the day I asked him about you know, the war. Now, you know, a lot of guys, they don't like to talk about it, but I was like 15, 14, and I was grilling them one day about, you know, so, Dad, when you were in the war, man, did you ever have to kill anybody? He goes, let me tell you something. War is hell, and you got to do what you got to do when, when you're in combat. It's kill or be killed. I said, well, you know, did you ever kill anybody? He goes, yeah, yeah, I kill people. <clears throat> and then I kept pressing him. He goes, ah, I don't even want to talk about it. I don't even want to, I don't want to talk about it. I go, well, just tell me about how many guys did you kill? You know, how many people did you have to kill? Because I had 17 confirmed kills. And that's something you gotta live with the rest of your life. And it's not something you like to live with. But I had to do what I had to do. That's, those were my orders, was to fight and defend the country. Right or wrong, that's what I had to do. He was sitting on this porch, he was like the mayor. He knew every single person on the street. That's one thing we don't have in communities anymore. We don't have anybody that knows their neighbors. Not only that, we don't even want to know our neighbors. But everybody knew everybody by name. On the corner, that was the Schwartzy house. The Schwartzes owned that. Arnold Schwartz still lives there. And this house, that was Sam Abramowitz. That was his house. This house, that was the Bacos across the street. The whole Baco family, they still live there to this day. And over here was my grandma's, and this over here was Frank Tanamonico's house. And my father, if he wasn't sitting here in the direct sun, how he sat in the sun, I don't know. Uh, see, my mother was Dutch, Irish, and English. My father was a full-blooded Sicilian. And I didn't get any of that ability to get tan. I got burnt, like I had two stages of sun. Burnt, peeling, burnt, peeling, or third, hospital. You know, being an idiot kid, I kept pressing him for more information. Let me give you one piece of valuable information. If you can count your friends on one hand, you're a wealthy man. Boy, does that hold true today. Because I've learned by experiencing life, and going in and out of friendship, you know, your value of friendships changes as you get older. It's what they bring to the table. And, uh, you know, he had a lot of words of wisdom, man. And then he would sit here, he goes, when we go fishing, he used to take him to Beersley Park and go fishing all the time for trout, bass, you know? He loved for trout fishing, man. He was, a, he was an extraordinary guy. And this house was open to every kid in the neighborhood. Black, white, Jewish, Hispanic, Polish. It didn't matter what nationality. We, it was just like the United Nations over here. They didn't judge anybody. They judged you by who you were, not by what you were. And that's why I think I'm a really, you know, kind of like rounded guy. You know, I've had experiences with all kinds of cultures and stuff. Across the street, right over there, and on that corner there, that was Schwartz's house. Around the corner, he still lives there, but his parents are long gone. And over there was the Baco's house. And over there was Sam Abramowitz's house. And over here was Frank Tanamonico's house. I still remember all these names, man. It's a trip. And, uh, you know, nothing really has changed, except that, uh, you know, the people have come and gone. Different people live here. This used to be my mother's rose bushes right here. This guy, as you notice, is uh, planted what they call, uh, what, they, what they call perennials or annuals or whatever. They come out every year, low maintenance. My mother had rose bushes up to the porch, red and white, beautiful roses. I mean, it, it was a trip. You know what, hey, here comes the new owner of the house right now, driving by on his bike right there, Rafael. That's the new guy. He bought the house. That's the new landlord right there, Rafael. Gracious enough to allow us to film right here at my old location, which uh, hats off to that guy. Well, hats off, but I'm having a real bad hair day. And you know, I wonder, where did this genesis of comedy begin? Where did the creativity come from? Why wasn't I a painter, a carpenter, a welder? Well, artists are inspired by their environment. 
which we're all products of our environment, and this is mine. This is my hometown, it's Bridgeport, where only the strong survive. Where we are right now, this is the alleyway. This is the back of what used to be Nine Brothers Bar, where my father used to drink beer and play pinochle with the old timers. They would sit around, and, you know, smoke cigars and, and, you know, make bets and whatnot. And this, the back door of a deli, and over here where the white truck is, that was a big, that was a big garage. It's not here anymore, they tore it down. And it was right on this very spot, right here where Satan jumped into my body. I, I know this sounds crazy. I don't really care what you think, but reality is a bummer, ain't it? But that's the way it is. And I felt that energy come in. It took me many years to get rid of it. But right here, this where this truck is, where I am, where we are right now, this old guy, we called him the crazy guy. He had a fedora hat, a cane, and a satchel bag. He was an old Jewish man. And he used to go to all the Jewish delis, Sunshine Market, Sam's uh, Delicatessen, and this this brick building used to be Tasty's Delicatessen, and it was uh, it was some of the best lox and bagels and cream cheese, all that good stuff. And the crazy guy used to come in here and sit and eat his food. And as kids, we used to we used to tease him and make him chase us. He said, you know, come out with his cane. I'm gonna kill you. I'll kill you. And he used to run after us because we thought, because the legend had it in his satchel bag, he carried around a million dollars. And we thought if we could ever get him off guard when he didn't have his bag, we could snatch the bag and become instant millionaires. Not exactly like playing the lottery, but you know, that, that was the whole thesis of why we chased this poor guy. I mean, my God, I, you know, if I could find that guy's grave, I'd go say a prayer for him, because we, I mean, the guy, the guy used to take the bus, the Madison Avenue bus, to downtown Bridgeport up here to the North End. And the theory was that his wife left him and saw her get on a bus, and that was the last he ever saw of his wife. So he rode the buses looking for his wife. That was the legend of the crazy guy. This pink building over here, that, that used to be Altieri Press. And I'll never forget it, man. The guy that ran the place, his father started it, but the guy that was running it, his son, his name was Bruce Altieri. This guy was a character. It was like circa 63, 64, 65. He used to walk up and down the street in a woman's dress. He was a transvestite. Not only was he a transvestite, he was a heroin addict. So he was a junkie transvestite. He was a junkie Ed Wood, you might say. And he used to do people's zodiac charts. So he's like witchy too, you know, he was witchy. So you know, he had, he had all kinds of characters. Hey, here. <laughs> Anthony Paco, oh my God. Anthony. Holy shit. Take a look, here's my neighbor from across the street. This is Anthony Paco. Look at this house. This is the best house on the whole street. It's like a fortress. This guy's. This guy's kept his, his father, Rocco, did uh, driveways and all that stuff. And Anthony and me used to get in so much trouble. I swear to God. We did everything from selling fireworks. Up, Johnny? Oh, my oh, God. Yeah. How you doing, Anthony? Time. How What's you doing? Up, 50 years, man. Holy <laughs> shit, man. We you believe this? Since we were kids. <laughs> this guy would tell you what f***ing nuts we were. I mean, we were really strongs, man. We were crazy, right? Was, uh... This guy would steal your cat, paint it a different color, and sell it back to you the next day. <laughs> I'm telling you, he used to work on cruise ships doing DJing before anybody was out there doing it. Anthony was always ahead of the game, always, right, Anthony? That's it. Those are the good times, Bob. And your grandma used to sit on the front porch. Yeah. You remember my grandma? Oh yeah, never forget her. <laughs> Old Rose, never forget her. She was nuts, man. She was off the hook. Am I right? Yep. Jeez. Oh my God. Anthony and I go way back. I remember. Uh, I remember we used to go uh, in that behind the bar. There used to be all these wild cats. Oh, this. Ooh, cats galore. <laughs> there was so many cats here, dude. There was there wasn't a fuck of mouse to be found in the whole neighborhood. There was so many wild cats. There must have been 200 of them back there. On Fourth of July, we used to get mats of firecrackers. Oh, that, fire, was, that was that was that was the, the fire, start. The fireworks were the thing in this neighborhood. We this whole street, everybody. I mean, the Rock and roll. cops never came. Let you blow off fireworks. Yeah, let you do whatever you want. Whatever you want to do. This guy used to get back in the day, not anymore, <laughs> so in case your cops are watching. <laughs>
you know, cop a walk because we're legitimate citizens. Just because we're Italian Americans, right. there's no such thing as you know what. That's right. But but we used to light up fireworks, man. It was a show, and everybody, right? Am I right? Everybody sat on the stool, right? There was no AC. There was no way air conditioning back in the summer. You had a fan. It was so hot. Our fathers would sit out, and parents used to sit out. Everybody waved at everybody across the street. Everybody it was like a community. It was a real community. Yeah, yeah. This was now, great now nobody knows nobody yeah, wants to know nothing. Yeah, it's all gone now. All right? It's over. Yeah. It's over. Good old it's neighborhoods over. are finished. That's it. Yeah, but this is a this is an old buddy of my Anthony Baco. How you doing, everybody in the party land? Yep, old school. We go back. 50 years, me and him. We were babies. We grew up together. Right across the street from each right other. Right across the street. We're still, we're still here. <laughs> we were hell raisers. We're still here. Right? When, we, when yeah. we went out in the street, the freaking neighbors got worried. If we left the house, people got worried. Hey, Tony, man. I got to come to my friend. Hey, always good seeing oh, you, man, John. You're right here, too. But nothing has changed. I see that. Be watching on the net for this. I watch for All right. it, All right? All right. All right. I'll okay, brother. There he goes, man. Right. That's a blast from the past right there, man. Comedy. It ain't pretty. Come on, I'm gonna show you a little more of my neighborhood, man. Let's go take a look at the, uh, up to the corner here, where the bar is. And uh, you, won't, you won't believe it. I mean, I can't even believe it. I remember I went down those stairs one day and I was smoking a joint when I got into reefer. I went down those stairs and uh, I was about five stairs down and I was smoking a joint and my mother caught me. And she was like, she wrote me a letter. You know, I'm the worst mother ever. I can't believe you're doing drugs. I wish I was dead. Man, I didn't touch a joint for like a whole year after that. I was like, you know, I would put on cologne. I would freaking use mouthwash, everything. If I smoked weed, I was so afraid my mother would smell it. Because she wrote me that letter. She wished she was dead. How's that for a hanger, right? This is the back door of the uh, bar. It used to be a wooden door. And uh, I remember my, my brother, uh, took uh, black tar and put his name Joe up here and it was his name was up here for like forever forever he put it up there back in the 50s when James Dean and all the rebels were really popular and uh, I don't even see it now but this used to be nine brothers bar now it's called the Oasis Wow can't believe it man here we are nine brothers bar man Wow change a little bit you know a little bit you see right here my father would sit right here every day and play cards they used to play peanut the old timers they would sit right here at the table every day and every day at five o'clock I had to come get my father out of here to go eat supper and this bar this is the original bar still yeah still the original bar this is now the Oasis bar cafe Along here was all these big booths, and the old guys used to sit here playing cards, drinking beer. And uh, where the flat screen TV is, there used to be a big painting of Babe Ruth, the baseball player. Big paint. The guy who painted it was drunk when he painted the picture. It was unbelievable. Most art comes from alcoholism. Check it out over here. The pool table, they still got a pool table here, man. Something does not change at all. The pool table used to go this way, like this, right here. And the guy that owned the bar in the past, his name was Dutch. Dutch Emil Klein. Emil Klein was his real name. We called him Dutch. And right here, where I first had my first roast beef sandwich for 50 cents, he had a little, he had a little burner right here, a little tray, and he would cook. Each slice of roast beef at a time. Take about 10 minutes before you got your sandwich. Raw onions, gravy, 50 cents. A beer was 50 cents. Man, I used to sit right here, wait for the sandwich, and I'd run up to my father's beer. I used to, I used to sip the foam, the head of the beer. My father was there, you want the foam? And I used to drink the beer, man. A lot of fond memories here, man. A lot of fond memories. Hey, thank you, everybody. Memory lane. Memory lane. That's the working title. Wow, that was a real trip, man, going into the Oasis Bar. There used to be Nine Brothers Bar where my, my dad used to play cards. Come on, I'll show you some more of the neighborhood. See this Chinese restaurant? This used to be, right here used to be a, uh, a butcher market. And right here, this uh, 
Madison Super Grocery. They used to be Sam's Delicatessen. This is the place I told you about before. This used to be Tasty's Delicatessen. It's that place right there. That was called McKinley Pharmacy. That's where I got my first real job in the real world. I used to sweep up the drugstore. I'll tell you a story about that. A guy from the North End Jail, his name was Bella Crager. He, uh, he, ro he broke it, did a B&E, breaking and entering of Mrs. Seeley's house, Mrs. Seeley's house. She was a direct descendant, so it was said, of the great P.T. Barnum. She was like 80 something years old and he, uh, he raped and then smothered her with a pillow. Pretty gruesome. And when I was sweeping up, he broke out of the North End Jail, which is a block down, and he came in in his jumpsuit, in his prison suit, and used the pay phone. And then he left. And about uh, approximately, about 15 minutes later, detectives came in, showed me a picture of the, have you seen this guy, Sonny? I go, yeah, he just used the, the phone booth. I mean, it was a walk-in phone booth, gangster style, with the sliding doors and everything. I guess he was making a call to hook up with his ride to get out of, get out of Dodge. That was McKinley Pharmacy, my first job. That's where my friend, come over here, where you can hear me a little better. There's a story attached to that. Our friend Dwayne Santoro from the neighborhood, he was, he was, he was a little ahead of his time. Guy could play anything on a guitar, natural born musician. But what happened to Dwayne is he got into drugs. And uh, he actually uh, robbed the pharmacy by removing bricks through the course of a night. Big cedar bricks broke the wall into the pharmacy and robbed the drugstore. He was then arrested in his apartment and then he was put in the North End Jail and the cops said that he hung himself with his own pants. But the theory is that he was beaten to death by the cops and then they just they just hung him up. So no one really knows what really happened to Dwayne. It was that was one of the first early tragedies that we had that, you know, it stayed with me for a long time. There it is, Michelizzi's Italian Ice. And on the right, this is a very interesting location right here. This used to be Donito's Pizza Parlor. It was one of the greatest pizza parlors around. Those stairs right there are all new. There used to be some old stairs that were right there. And uh, me and my boys used to hang out here. Right here at Donito's Pizza. And right there where that cellar window is, that's where I met one of my really dear friends, Ronnie. My father called him Two Pants, Ronnie Two Pants, because we used to go shoplifting all the time for clothes, and we used to bring like four or five pairs of jeans, and, and of course we keep one or two pair under our baggy pants, pay for one, and steal two. And with two guys, that was four pairs of pants, and that was Ronnie's hustle. So my father called him Two Pants Ronnie. Right here is Central High School, and see that fence over there? There's a whole story behind that fence. My father bought me a Stingray bike with the banana seat and the ape hanger bars, you know, you used to pop wheelies with them and stuff. The bike was brand new. These three kids jumped me and took my bike. It was the first time I ever got jumped. I ran home crying. My father was like, fun of all bitch, get in the car. And he pulls up this street and the kids were shoving the bike under the fence, but it was stuck. And we pulled up on them and they split bike and I actually retrieved my bike and my father was like watch out when you ride that bike you know you gotta be aware of your surroundings and I mean always look around before you go somewhere and ride your bike this is not a safe neighborhood and that's when I kind of started to realize that you know you gotta have your guard up I don't care